Hi, I'm John Davidson, lead pastor at Evangel Temple. Thank you so much for tuning into the message today. I hope it's a blessing and an encouragement to you. If it is, leave us a note in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. I hope you enjoy this message from God's Word today. Now, today our passage mentions everyone's favorite topic, taxes. I remember my first time doing taxes. I was in college. I was sitting on my bed crying my eyes out, stressed out, uh, because I felt that I was probably accidentally committing tax fraud, because I didn't know what the questions were asking me from TurboTax. I'm calling my mom. My mom's stressed out. It's like when you ask your parent for help on math homework. They don't know what they're doing either. So everyone is freaking out. I don't know. I feel like the IRS is going to break down my door any second and come and drag me away from Evangel. So it, it, it's stressful. Doing your taxes is stress, stress, stressful. Benjamin Franklin has this great quote where he says, the only certainty in life is death and taxes. Now, before you tune me out, because this passage is seemingly about taxes, I believe that God's word always has something to teach us. Uh, this word wasn't just written for the people 2,000 years ago, but it's alive and active, and God wants to speak something to you today. So would you lean in and listen to what God wants to say to you? So Matthew 17, 24 through 27, it says, on their arrival in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked him, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, Peter replied. Then he went into the house. But before he had a chance to speak, Jesus asked him, what do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they have conquered? They tax the people they have conquered, Peter replied. Well, then Jesus said, the citizens are free. However, we don't want to offend them, so go down to the lake, throw in a line, open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you will find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the tax for both of us. Now, what is going on here? This passage, uh, much like the passage we read a few weeks ago about the transfiguration, Matthew doesn't tell us, uh, Jesus doesn't tell us why he's saying this. We don't really know what's going on here. So, so what's happening? So Jesus and his disciples are in Capernaum a familiar town. They've been in this town several times, and the collectors of the temple tax come up to Peter and ask him, is your teacher going to pay the temple tax? Now, this tax was not a Roman tax. It didn't go to Caesar. Um, it wasn't a civil obligation. Um, it was for the temple, the Jewish temple, the upkeep of the temple. We read about this tax in Exodus 30. Now in Exodus 30, we find out that this tax was actually a requirement of the Jewish people to upkeep the temple. But over the years, this tax becomes optional. So some Jews pay it, and some Jews don't. So if Jesus and Peter decided not to pay the temple tax, they wouldn't have been alone. There were tons of other people who didn't pay the tax. So these tax collectors asked Peter, does your teacher pay the temple tax? It seems, just like we see the Pharisees do over and over again, they're, they're trying to get, they're trying to trick or trying to test to see what's happening. So they're trying to test to see, does Jesus really care about Jewish customs? Does he care and support the temple? So Peter, out of support and loyalty for Jesus, quickly says, yes, he does. He's driven by his loyalty to Jesus, trying to defend Jesus' reputation. But, when uh, Peter goes back into the house, Jesus, who knows everything, immediately asks Peter about the temple tax. Isn't that just like Jesus? He already knows what's going on in our hearts before we even say a word. So Jesus asks him, what do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they have conquered? Now, guess what? Jesus isn't talking about taxes here. Surprise! Jesus is talking about identity. Jesus is making the point that kings don't tax their children. The, their sons and daughters, they're part of the royal family. Um, you don't tax your children for living in your home. They're, they're part of the benefits of being a child. They don't pay taxes. They live in the benefits of the kingdom. The tax is collected for the temple, which is God's house, and Jesus is the son of God. Therefore, he shouldn't owe anything to the temple's temple tax because it's his father's house. So why would he owe anything to it? Yet, we'll see Jesus respond in a surprising way. So what Jesus is saying here is, 
is that he's the son of God. He's free from the obligations of the law. And guess what? Because we're united with Christ in faith, we have the same freedom. We're children of God, Paul writes in Galatians 4, 7. Now you are no longer a slave, but you are God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. God has made you his heir. You are a child of God. This is incredible because we're no longer slaves to the law of performance, of doing enough, of being enough. We are children of the king, living in the benefits of the kingdom. If you've placed your faith in Jesus, you are not just a servant trying to earn your place. You are a son or daughter who already belongs Jesus goes on to say, well then, the citizens are free. Other translations say the children are exempt. He's teaching Peter and us a critical lesson about our identity. Being a child of God changes everything. It changes how we approach God, how we live our lives, and it should change how we view ourselves. The question for you today is, do you know who you are? For many of us, the way we view ourselves is shaped by the expectations of others or our own sense of inadequacy. We often feel like we have to prove ourselves at work, in our families, in our friendships, at school, wherever it may be. We feel like there's this constant need to measure up, to do enough, to be enough. The human heart is wired to measure up. We're constantly trying to prove our worth to others to God, saying, I- I've gone to church enough. I-, I give a lot of church, a lot of money to the church. We even try to prove to ourselves that we're good enough. As Tim Keller says, everyone is doing something to justify their existence. Now look, if we're all honest here today, we're all trying to look cooler than we actually are. We're all trying to look more put together than we actually are. Uh, When I first became a youth pastor, I went to this youth pastor lunch, and there were tons of other youth pastors there, and one characteristic about all of them, if you didn't know, youth pastors apparently have really cool shoes. I wasn't in on this information at the time, though. So I show up to this meeting. I just have sandals on. It's summertime, and everyone else has the coolest shoes they spent lots of money on. I don't know how they afforded it as youth pastors, but somehow they did. They came in with these awesome shoes, and everyone's like, wow, those are cool shoes. Those are cool shoes. We talked about shoes for like 30 minutes or more, and I'm sitting there, and I felt so out of place with my little sandals, and I just wanted to belong. I just wanted to feel accepted. I just want to feel included, and so what I did right after that meeting, I went to Red Rex, and I found the nicest pair of Adidas I could at Red Rex for $20. So I get these shoes, but the problem was um, they were a size too small. But I still wore them to my next youth pastor meeting. So I pull up to the next youth pastor meeting, and I'm like, look at these shoes. And everyone's like, wow, Abby, those shoes are awesome. And I was like, finally, I've made it. Like, I feel accepted now. I can be a youth pastor now because I have cool shoes. And so um, I wore those shoes all day long. People were complimenting them all day. I was like, man, I've arrived. Like, this is good. Okay, okay. The problem was, when I got home that night, my feet were bleeding because they were too small. And the Lord instantly taught me, Abby, you're trying so hard to be someone else. Would you just be who I've created you to be? Would you just be who I've called you to be? And so often we try to do that in every circumstance. We try to measure up to be like everyone around us. But really, most often, We're like that photo on Facebook that someone's tagged us in where we have a double chin and everyone else looks great and we're standing in a weird position and we immediately untag ourselves from that photo. (laughs) But the thing about God is, is that God sees the unfiltered version of you and he calls you accepted and he calls you his child And I hope that's freeing to you like it's freeing for me. I don't have to perform for God. I don't have to to be enough for him. But I bring what little I have to him and say, Jesus, this is all I have. And he freely accepts me. Jesus is telling Peter and us about our relationship with God. And he's telling us that it's different. He's telling us we are already loved. We are already accepted. And we are all 
ready his children. And this truth should lift a weight off your shoulders. Because we belong to God's family, not because of what we do, not because of how much you give, not how many groups you're a part of, but because of you, who you already are in Christ. God's love is not conditional on your performance, but is freely given because of the work Jesus has already done. Though, freedom in Christ doesn't mean we live without any responsibility in this world, and we'll see that in just a moment. Now, this passage takes a really interesting turn here. Jesus could have just said, yeah, I'm the son of God. That's God's temple. Like, that's God's house. That's my father's house. I don't have to pay anything. We're done here. But Jesus doesn't say that. Get this. This is what he says. However, we don't want to offend them. So go down to the lake, throw in a line, open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you will find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the tax for the both of us. Though Jesus was exempt from the tax, he chooses to pay it. Why? To avoid causing offense. Jesus is modeling something profound for us here. He's showing us that while we have freedom as God's children, we are also called to live in a way that considers others. Just because we have the right to do something doesn't mean we should always exercise that right. Jesus had every right not to pay the tax but he chose to lay aside his right for the sake of others. So what does this look like in our own lives? Family in the room, you have the freedom to chase success in your career or in your personal life, but have you considered how that that chase affects your family? What if you laid aside some of your ambitions to prioritize your spouse, your children, or even the church? If you're retired in the room, you have the freedom of time and resources in, that se- in this season. How are you using that freedom? Are you investing in the next generation? Are you pouring into younger believers who need guidance and encouragement? We often focus so much on our rights and freedoms, but as followers of Jesus, our freedom is always coupled with responsibility to love others well. Let me say that again for you. Our freedom is always coupled with responsibility to love others well. And sometimes that means laying down our rights for the sake of someone else's well-being. The world tells us that our freedom means having no restrictions. We get to do whatever we want, whenever we want to. But in the kingdom, freedom looks different. It's not about removing all boundaries. It's about living within the right ones. Think about it. We don't let kids play in the middle of the street or on the highway, not because we don't want them to have fun or care about them, but we know that safety for them means boundaries. It means safety, caring for them. In Christ, we have been freed from the burden of earning our salvation. But that freedom comes with responsibility. Galatians 5.13 says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Use your freedom to serve one another in love. Our freedom isn't for selfish gain. It's for the sake of others. And Jesus models this in the passage. He didn't have to pay the tax but he chose to in order to not cause offense, to love others well. As children of God, we're called to live in two kingdoms. We live in the kingdom of God and in the kingdom of earth. And of course, our ultimate loyalty is to the kingdom of God, but we're also responsible to our local, national, and global communities. And sometimes that means doing things we don't enjoy, like paying taxes, or voting, or following the law, like the speed limit. Jesus didn't avoid his responsibilities as a citizen of this world. He played by the rules, respected the law of his day, not because he had to, but because he wanted to avoid offense. He wanted to demonstrate love and humility. He was showing us that our civic responsibilities matter because they affect our ability to influence the people around us. Now, let's be honest. There are moments in our lives where we want to say, I'm only accountable to God, or I don't have to do this. 
I think about this in my own life sometimes because there are people in authority over me and sometimes they make decisions I don't like. And my immediate reaction is to either complain or gripe about it. That's my human's heart, natural inclination. But guess what? Jesus doesn't do that here. Jesus doesn't immediately complain or gripe. He's humble. He respects the systems of his day and shows us that love sometimes looks like going the extra mile, even when you don't have to. In verse 27, he says, however, we don't want to offend them. The, the word offend here in the original language means more along the lines of ca not causing someone to spiritually stumble. Offense here isn't about irritation or inconvenience. It's about causing someone to spiritually stumble. I want you to think for a moment about a friend in your life who doesn't know Jesus. I want you to think about that friend. Maybe they have questions about faith. They're a little iffy about coming to church, about church people. And they're spending time with you, someone who they look up to spiritually. And you're hanging out. Maybe it's at a restaurant. And they hear you complaining about church, gossiping about people, being rude to the waiter. And your friend thinks, if this is what church people are like, I don't want anything to do with church or Jesus. And I know it feels like these little insignificant moments of like, Pastor Abby, does that really matter? But no, it does matter. Any interaction with other people and the way we talk about people, we represent Jesus. And so they're not insignificant moments. They are significant moments in the lives of people because we're representing who Jesus is. And if we're that kind of bad example to our unbelieving friends, then we're creating an obstacle for them to see who Jesus really is. We have to ask ourselves, what areas of our lives are we fighting unnecessary battles that could lead someone to stumble? Where are we demanding our way when it's creating a roadblock for others to hear about the gospel? Maybe it's in your relationships, in your family, at work, or even here in the church. There are things that frustrate us. There are decisions that we don't agree with and we don't like. But the real question is, is this issue worth creating a barrier to the gospel? At our church, there may be things that you don't prefer. That's okay and to be expected. Because wherever you go, whether it's church, your business, a school, they're never going to make decisions that you 100% agree with. And we have to ask ourselves, is this matter of eternal significance or am I fighting for my personal preference? Jesus shows us that his love for people outweighed his desire to exercise his rights. Jesus didn't have a problem offending people. We see this time and time again in the gospel. Think about his interaction with the Pharisees. He calls them a brood of vipers. I don't know about you, but that feels pretty offensive to me. And we see him say really hard things to the disciples. But it was because he was challenging them. But we see right here in this passage that when it means someone might stumble because of what he does or what he says, he acts out of love and humility and does something he doesn't have to do for the sake of love and community. Jesus lays down his preferences. We have to ask ourselves, when should we assert our voice and when should we lay it down for the sake of love and unity? And there are certainly times we must speak out. When we see injustice, we have to say something about it. When we see something wrong, we need to speak out just as Jesus did. But most of the time, Jesus didn't waste his energy on the minor things. He didn't argue over small preferences. He humbled himself, followed the rules, and saved his voice for what really matters. When we constantly are using our voice to demand our own way in every small circumstance, every small issue, it becomes white noise. But when we lay down our rights, when we live humbly, and we stand up for what really matters, our voice carries weight. People will listen because they know that we've chosen our battles wisely. These verses remind us that Jesus, the Son of God, could have asserted his right, could have asserted his rights, but he chose humility and love instead. He didn't have to pay the temple tax. He had every right to refuse, but he laid down his rights to avoid causing offense and show us a powerful example of what it means to live both as children and servants. 
He lived for a higher purpose. Not just to follow the law, but to love people and remove any barrier that might cause them to not know him. Now, today I have a hammer and a feather here. This hammer represents asserting our rights. It's forceful, it's strong, it can get the job done. It can build things and it can break things, but it often leaves damage behind. And in a lot of situations, we come in with the hammer, with our preferences and our opinions and are trying to assert our rights. Let me give you an example. You're at Thanksgiving dinner with your family. Someone brings up politics. And you grab your hammer of preferences and opinions. And you want to assert your right to tell them exactly what you think about what they think. You want to tell them, that's not, that's not right. That's not of God. You need to listen to me. But we begin to create a barrier to the gospel in those relationships because we've decided to choose this instead of humility. And this looks like the stronger thing. This looks like the, the right thing to do. But in the kingdom of God, what is strong to the world is weak. And what is weak to the world is strong in the eyes of Jesus. This feather represents humility. It's light, it's soft, and it's gentle. And at first glance, it doesn't seem like it could accomplish much. But have you ever seen a feather float in the wind? It travels farther than you ever thought possible. Jesus didn't wield the hammer of his rights in this situation. Instead, he chooses the feather of humility. And in doing so, he accomplishes a greater purpose. Rather than proving a point, he maintains peace and demonstrates love. When we insist on our own way, or let our pride get in the way, we might be creating these obstacles. Maybe it's gossiping in a small group are using our opinions to dominate the conversation instead of listening. It's in these moments we're more like the hammer than the feather, leaving dents instead of lifting others up. Jesus went out of his way to avoid causing someone to stumble. And why? Because he knew that even the little things could become obstacles in someone's journey towards faith. We're called to live humbly, to love others, and to take the extra st step even if it's inconvenient to keep others from tripping up. And this is our call today. We live in a world where, where our need, our want to assert our rights is constant, whether it's in our relationships, at work, or even in the church. But what is Christ calling us to do? He is calling us to lay down our rights, not out of weakness, not out of being a doormat and letting people walk all over us, but for the sake of unity, out of love, he's calling us to think beyond ourselves, to look at the bigger picture and ask ourselves, is my insistence on having my own way going to become a stumbling block to someone else? Maybe it's in your finances, where you've been so focused on getting what you feel you've deserved and what you've earned that you've overlooked opportunities to be generous to other people. What if... You took $50 a month and set it so aside to be generous to other people. I was in college, uh, going to Evangel University, working at a restaurant in town, and I was here at Evangel Temple on a Sunday morning, talking with my friends, and I was telling them about this special event I had coming up. And I was like, guys, I just don't have enough money for clothes for this event. Like, I really want to uh, get the right outfit for the special event I have to go to, but I don't have enough money. This woman, this wonderful woman of God, overhears the conversation, comes up and gives me money for the clothes for this special event right here at Evangel Temple. And the woman's generosity moved me, not just because she gave to me financially, but because she took the time to hear me, to see me, and to meet my need, to, to take money out of her own pocket, to sacrifice. Maybe it's in your time. You might be in a busy season, but even small sacrifices of time can make a big difference in someone's life. Maybe it even just looks like sitting and listening to a friend who's struggling. Or it's in your opinions, whether it's about politics, social issues, or how things should be done. You're holding on so tightly to your own perspective that it's creating division in your family and your friendships. And God might be asking you to step back, listen, and let love guide your interactions. Because our freedom isn't just for us. 
It's for the sake of others. Worship team, if you would come up. What's more important to you? Winning the argument or winning someone to Christ? Is your pride worth the cost causing someone to stumble? In this last verse, Jesus goes on to tell Peter to do something a little strange. Go down to the lake and throw in a line. Open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you will find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the tax for both of us. I imagine Peter's reaction being like, Jesus, I'm a fisherman, not a magician. But sure enough, Peter goes, opens the, co- opens the, mouth, the, fish, the mouth of the fish, and there's a coin inside. I- imagine if we paid our bills like that today. You'd be like, hey, babe, rinse do. I'm going to go fishing real quick. We often forget that Jesus didn't have much. Luke 18 tells us he lived off the donations of others. Matthew 8.20 tells us he didn't even have a place to lay his head. So when he decides to pay the temple tax, Jesus likely doesn't have the money. But instead of worrying, Jesus performs a miracle to provide the funds. This wasn't a miracle for show. It was necessary. Jesus laid down his rights and he trusted that God would provide. We often feel like we don't have enough, whether it's time, money, energy, whether that be physically or emotionally. Jesus didn't have the coin, but he didn't let that stop him from fulfilling his responsibility to love others well. God's resources go beyond what we can see or understand. If he can put money in the mouth of a fish, surely he can provide for us in ways that seem unexpected. You may not always know how he'll provide, but this passage invites us to trust that he will. It's a reminder that when we step out of faith, step out in faith, when we lay down our personal preferences for the sake of others, that God will meet our needs, he'll provide, he'll bless us in those moments. When we're faithful to love others well, to not be so inward focused, but to shift our eyes onto other people. Would you bow your heads this morning? Today, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal an area where we might need to lay down our rights and choose humility. Maybe it's in a conflict you've been wrestling with with a family member or a decision where you've been digging your heels in. We're going to ask God to give us the strength to do what Jesus did, to let go of our rights, let go of our personal preferences, to love people more and to build unity for the sake of the gospel. Thanks again for watching the service today. I hope it was an encouragement to you. We'd love to hear from you. So if you'd like to leave a note in the comments and let us know what you thought about the message, we'd love that. And if you're ever in the Springfield, Missouri area on a Sunday morning, we'd love to have you join us for church. You can attend our 8 a.m. classic service or you can join us for church at 9.30 or 11.